Hey everyone, welcome back to the Cyber Hub Engage podcast Friday wrap up. We have a very, very special guest joining us today to talk about the first week of 2020 and what all the cyber stuff that's gone on this week from the tensions with Iran to all these different ransomware strains that are showing up. It's going to be a great, great episode. I have joining me Professor Yuta Lendl one of our newest supporters on the podcast, which I'm very grateful for their support. He's the uh, founder and CEO of Unbound Tech, and he was a former professor at Bar Ilan University in Israel, one of my favorite universities. I was telling you offline, Yuda, welcome. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you on. Thank you for your support. Um, we're always eternally grateful for that. So, I was, I was, you know, you and I were talking offline and I told you I love Bar Ilan. It's like one of my favorite universities in Israel. I think it's a, it's, it's a world-class institution. And so, you know, just briefly before we kind of start talking about all the ransomware stuff, you went from a professor to starting a company on encryption. Why? Most people want to go to <laughs> teaching and never want to leave it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, sometimes I ask myself that question, right? Uh, I, I found that my research actually just led to something that I think really solved the problem. I started doing the, the research in theory, and that led to something which was practical, but too complicated for just the industry to take. So I took the plunge and uh, decided that the last the step of that, uh, really having impact in my research, is actually commercializing. And I'm glad that I have. It's uh, it's an interesting ride. Well, I, I will say this: um, I've known of Unbound for a, a few years now, and and Tom, who's one of your, you know, one of your U.S. persons, is a really really good friend of mine. We were texting yesterday, and I was like, "Hey, Tom, you guys are on board, and thank you." And he's like, "We need to go get coffee." And I love Tom, so shout out to you know to Tom. Um, thank you very much. And so. Um, so let's talk a little bit about 2020 and this the, this first week in cybersecurity has been just really crazy from geopolitical kind of cyber stuff with you know the uh, Iran and but predominantly if we go and look at the criminal side uh ransomware kind of really started becoming main mainstream in in the fact of you had maze ransomware starting out in november december setting up public websites shaming their victims saying if you don't pay us in seven days we're not going away we're not deleting your files we're going to put your files for everyone to see we're going to run the sony uh playbook on you and just put your stuff out there and let you deal with not only the fallout from a cyber attack but could be internal riff or 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 improprietarities and other stuff that exists within a within a corporate network and the Sudanokibi gang has now done the exact same thing. And the other upgrade that Sudanokibi has done now, which has been very fascinating, is that they're now encrypting and deleting backups. How in the world do you start defending that as a CISO? Like, <laughs> if, if, so if they... I, I, yeah, I think the first thing we have to understand is that the criminals have found a direct way of getting money from cyber attacks. It's much more profitable and much more direct than stealing credit card numbers or stealing information and hoping that you can find someone who'll actually pay for it for you. Um, and once criminals have a good way of getting money, they're not going away, right? Uh, bank robbers were around for a long time until it was turned out to be not worth it. And law enforcement generally relies on two factors. One is deterrence, and the other is uh, prevention. So deterrent is because I can punish you and throw you in jail, and that's why bank rob robberies are, uh, are less frequent today. In the cyber world, there is no deterrent. There's only prevention. Uh, if we, in the physical world, if we only had uh, prevention or deterrent, we'd have to have a police officer on every corner of every street in the city, and it's not viable. So that's a challenge that is just going to remain. And that's something that we have to understand and accept. It's not going away. So we talk about their, you know, their, their, their uh, modest, op uh, their, their, their operation levels of when they get into your network, they're, they're going after um, y your data, they're encrypting your data, they're deleting your data, um, they're, they're deleting your backups, they're not giving you any opportunity. How can encryption play a role? Um, in preventing yes. these so, these ransomware attacks? So I think there are three things that we have to do and in order to defend. The, there, 
The first, uh, um, which is the most important, is, is a technological solution, which is to have backups that are write only, uh, you can only or append only backups. In other words, you can't actually, your computer actually has no permissions to modify any backup that was made. Th that solution is actually a very strong solution because if you have that on your system, then ransomware that's in your network actually doesn't have the permissions to go and actually modify the backup. It doesn't mean you won't have a very painful experience in restoring from backup, but you'll be in a far better position than, uh, than today when you actually com can completely use your data. So since you can only append, you can't delete backups, you can't erase backups, you can't modify backups, you just can't touch them at all. And such solutions do exist. You can actually uh, deploy such a solution. You regularly back up to something that's append only, and, uh, uh, and that can already be a very strong mitigation. Of course, the next level will be, will the, will the uh, next level of ransomware find a hole in that system so that it can bypass the permissions? But, but that's, you know, that's just the standard sort of situation, you know, sort of security situation that we have. And, and, and that's the primary thing that I would tell everybody to look for a solution like that. That's the first thing. The second thing is just, of course, standard security practices of having good firewalls and having a good uh, email, uh, um, having good email filters and having everything to be patched and everything updated. That's just the standard sort of thing that you had to do until now. But if your organization uh, wasn't giving you the funds and the resources to do that, now you can go to the CEO and tell them, look at what's going on. If you want us to be completely shut down or have our data completely erased, um, this is a real threat. It's a real threat now. We need to, to implement all these solutions. That's the second thing that is necessary. And the third thing, again, is a standard one, but it's education. All of the employees in the company need to go through regular security training about what to click on, uh, what to do when you get an email that you're not 100% sure about, uh, what to do in terms of uh, when you have certain pop-ups or things that appear that, that are not standard. All of those things should be just a part of our regular education. I actually think this is true, not just in the business world. We teach our kids not to cross or how to cross the road. We teach our kids not to take candy from a stranger. We don't teach them anything about cybersecurity, which is something they're going to need in the future. And it's also about their safety as teenagers when they're in social networks. That's a different topic. But in the business world, there needs to be regular training for this. You know, you kind of, um... We talk about training a lot. We talk about user behavior and the human kind of being your first, last, and only line of defense against these kinds of attacks. Oftentimes, it's it's there's a, there's ver, there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to encryption. So one of the ones I'll, I'll talk to you about, which is, I've spoken to a victim of the Sudanokibi uh, ransomware attack. And I was speaking to the information security officer of that specific firm, which will remain unnamed because it was kind of an off the record conversation. But his his um, one of his grand mistakes was the level of which they input the encryption in, meaning that I, th I think they put it in at the folder level rather than the file level or or. Or, or something along those lines, which they were able to really manipulate, go in and encrypt it at a, at a, what level do you recommend to encrypt data so that it's really, it really does become secure? So, the, the, so, so here, these are two different questions, right? One is what do I need to do to prevent my data from being stolen and posted on a public website? And what do I need to do to prevent the ransomware from encrypting my data so that, so that I can't get access? If it's the former, uh, I think that it's not as important at what level you encrypt the data. The question is how you protect the keys and what uh, you do to prevent decryption. So if, for example, you're on your machine, you encrypt your files, but the ransomware, of course, you have your permissions to decrypt your files, and the ransomware is on your machine, they could just decrypt them one by one themselves as well because they have a, they have the same permissions and access that you have. Correct. So I, so uh, what you definitely don't want is a situation where you have a database, a massive database that's encrypted, um, and there are good solutions for that. Not, it's not always trivial, but, but it's encrypted, but the key is also in the same place so that the attacker just steals the key together with the encrypted data, 
and decrypts it all at home offline, you can't detect that with anomaly detection or anything like that because they're actually doing it offline and at home. Uh, so that I think when you think about encryption, it's how you how you prevent malicious decryptions and how you protect the key. The best is application layer encryption where you're, you're data is encrypted and the key is actually somewhere else and it's an application, but the application has that key. That sometimes is difficult in the database world and so people often do more trivial things like just encrypt the entire database uh, on disk, but it's actually open in, in, in memory and that, that is uh, unfortunately much weaker because an attacker gets to the machine can just take a snapshot of, of RAM. So transitioning a little bit from ransomware, let's go to hardware. FBI this week, I mean, they're trying to um, get access to the phone of the Saudi uh, terrorist airman who shot up the uh, Naval Air Station in Pensacola. They had to go get a court order to do this. Mind you, this attack was, I think, in late November, early December. We're now in January. Very, very slow. We, we Obviously, this hinders investigations. What are some of the, the tools that law enforcement really needs to have in terms of ensuring that they can get access to these devices and unencrypt them without even a court order, for, for that matter? But let's not go down the legal path. Let's go down the actual, you know, physical path of do they really need to get a court order and do does the FBI really need to get help to, to decrypt someone's phone? So whether the FBI actually needs to do it or they have other reasons for asking Apple to do it, that's an interesting question that I don't know the answer to. But I certainly have my suspicions. Uh, I think for me, uh, the main thing is that weakening the security of everyone who has an iPhone in the world in order to make it easier for the FBI to get access uh, to a criminal or a terrorist phone is a bad solution. And, uh, and we have to fo be focused on that discussion. So I'm all in favor of targeted surveillance. You have, a, you have someone, we have reasonable, uh, um, what's the word? I can't remember it, uh, where, where you, you have reasonable assumption that someone, uh, you need to track someone, you get a court order, you get, uh, uh, you're allowed to search their home in the same way you're allowed to search their phone. Yes, I certainly need a court order. I don't think this should be something available without a court order, otherwise, why don't we allow police to search people's homes without any court order? Um, but you're asking Apple to prepare to, to, to do that for them essentially means weakening the security for everyone because once Apple does that, then they have a system which enables them to uh, undermine the encryption and that system can be stolen. Um, as we know, there are no secrets. And when you have a secret that opens all the locks of the world, you're in a bad situation. I actually have a very, very strong opinion on that. I'll give you a very extreme example. We, we sort of have a, we're very used to the idea of privacy in the physical world and in the digital world, we just sort of throw it all away. Uh, but actually there are many, many more people who die or are, suffer from domestic abuse than almost anything else in most Western countries. And we have a great solution for that. It's to put a camera in every single room of every single house and to, uh, um, to, to continually uh, film what's going on in every single room in every single house. And if uh, someone shuts that camera down, then the police come straight away. It's a great solution. And uh, people should be very happy for that solution. But we all understand that I'm being facetious. Uh, privacy is, an important, uh, is, is important. And it, it's not true that security or making law enforcement's life easier is all, always trumps privacy. And once uh, we kind of have privacy of our conversations, of our location, of anything on our phones, on anything on our devices, because there are backdoors out there, then uh, it's not only the government that's going to use it, it's not only the US government, it's going to be the Chinese government and the Russian government and the Saudi government and the Iranian government that are also going to be using uh, those backdoors once they're out there. So we're talking to Professor Yuta Lindel. He's the uh, founder and CEO of Unbound Tech. And let's talk a little bit about snake ransomware. So this is the new form of ransomware. It's it's making its headway. It's it, it's it's entire way of infiltrating your network and going in and encrypting your your data. It's deleting your backups as it kind of goes through with it. It's a sleeper ransomware to begin with. It seems like ransomwares are starting to become a major threat to major corporations. 
this specific snake ransomware doesn't target the small business it's not targeting that call center operator in sherwood uh california it's not targeting the small healthcare facility these are going after massive enterprise networks as you know for our listeners that work in the enterprise realm which we have a lot of what are some of the the tips we can kind of what, what are some of the expertise you can share with them in terms of how do you start defending and protecting your network from these kinds of invasive ransomware attacks Right, so you know, with Snake also, it's actually really encrypting the entire corporate network, right? So it's searching for that and going through and encrypting across the board. The damage is just is just <clears throat> enormous. Uh, it's it's truly the case where this is a danger to to your survival as a business, uh, and and everyone has to be first aware of that. And when we have something that is a danger to the continuation of our ability to do business that becomes top priority in the company. And that awareness is a first step. Uh, of course, it's not a technical step. The technical steps are what I discussed this beforehand. Actually, it doesn't make a difference which ransomware it is. Uh, you have to do the same things. So you have to make sure that you have backups that even your own computers are unable to touch. So append only backups, no delete, no modify uh, to those backups so that the ransomware also can't get to it. The second is um, all the standard security practices, and the third is education. There's just nothing we can do beyond that. It would be nice that we could have, you know, some sort of silver bullet. We don't have it in any any place in uh, in computer security, and we certainly don't have it for ransomware as well. Um, the first solution is the best technical solution that there is, uh, and it's helpful. Uh, making it a top priority is what I would guess is the first step that uh, CISOs should should be bring this up at, at the highest level of management as a real threat and, and it should be taken as seriously as so. So kind of looking at the a lot of the geopolitical cyber tensions that are going on um, today in the world, I think um, one of the bigger anticipations from the U.S.-Iran um, kind of send off wasn't necessarily, you know, that faked missile attack but rather it was the cyber activity that we've seen a significant uptick in is there anything from from your end that you're seeing that that you're concerned about from an iranian capabilities from their apts or anything of that nature you know i, I don't have personal insider knowledge but iran is a very sophisticated well-educated uh country that has invested a lot in its science uh, there's no doubt that such a country has very high, very strong cyber capabilities. And uh, and th that's a huge concern. I mean, the, the, the notion that war is not only going to be held in the physical realm, but also in, uh, in the cyber realm is something that we've known for a long time. And we're starting to see manifestations of that. It could be from things like uh, tampering with power plants and water that we've seen, you know, we've seen some of those as well. It can even be something like, uh, what would happen if, you know, God forbid, okay, but you had something like a 911, but at the same time, 911 and the electricity was shut down. Just think about the difference and how much worse it would even be, right? So you shut down 911, you shut down cellular communication, you shut, you shut down electricity, and then boom. So if everything is amplified, uh, incredibly amplified. So it's not that we, you know, want to fear monger or anything, but this is an this is a these are concerned of national secure of the, the highest national security, and yeah, I, I, I certainly believe that Iran has very strong and uh, cyber capabilities. Is it in their interest to do something so extreme? I assume not, and I hope uh, very much not. Right? They. Uh, um, the lessons of the past is that you sometimes don't want to succeed too 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 greatly in, in these things because then the ramifications are, are far greater than you wanted. Here we do have deterrent, unlike in the ransomware world. Here there is deterrent, and deterrent is what really helps. We know, and I don't know, uh, as gr growing up in the 80s, the 70s and 80s, uh, in Cold War era, uh, the fact that both sides had nuclear weapons is probably the best thing for the world. But that was the deterrence. That was the deterrence. Yeah, no one tried exactly. to do anything because of that. Yeah. I think with Iran, um, 
th- there was no deterrence up until about you know uh, a week uh, eight days ago when we uh, when when a beautiful missile launched from a uh, beautiful American drone took the life of the world's number one terrorist and kind of laid the groundwork of deterrence like we're not going to go after your proxies we're not going to go after your recruits and your foot soldiers we're going to go after your leaders um, kind of final question and really kind of shifting from all of this workforce shortage and cyber is a, a main concern a lot of people talk about it specifically around cryptography key management encryption that that seems to be the one place where there's a ton a ton of shortage how do we fix it you are a professor <laughs> you run unbound tech i mean you guys i mean so, so solve that problem for us please professor yuda <laughs> so this is a huge problem and I'll, I'll make it even worse is that uh if you don't understand cryptography well the chance of using it properly are almost zero so industry can help by providing solutions but you need enough people to build those solutions well and yeah there's a huge shortage of uh, there's a huge so- shortage of uh, software engineers it's a huge shortage of uh, uh, cybersecurity professionals uh, within that subset, and there's uh, uh, an even bigger shortage of cryptographers within that subset. Until 10, 15 years ago, cryptography was like, you know, not of much interest to most of the world. I think we have to start, uh, we have to look, we have to understand that it's going to take a long time. Once we accept it's going to take a long time, we have to start I- in high school. We have to start encouraging um, people already in high school, both boys and girls to go into these areas, that these areas are very interesting, that uh, it's a it's a great uh, profession. You can earn a good salary. We have to make sure that our companies provide good work-life balance so that people actually want to go into those areas. Um, you know, we're not going to solve it in one or two years. Yeah, there can be very large government investment in uh, building or, or supporting computer science departments, uh, but uh, that Starting at the end of the funnel is not going to be good enough. We start earlier, and and we can do a lot there. So it's going to take ten years until we see the results. But let's at least tr- do that now, so that we're going to have the results in ten years' time. If we just focus on the university level already, it's too late. Could automation be a solution for this? Uh, is there is there an opportunity for automation in cryptography? I, I don't think so, actually. I mean, again, when you build the tools, if you build a tool that will automatically... Yeah, so a specific tool could, autom- could, could use automation to help you with encryption of your ne- network files or something to that effect. But again, you need someone to be able to build that. You need to know how to deploy it. You need to know how to configure it. These things are not out of the box, you know, if you have anomaly detection, even that you have to configure, right? Otherwise, you have too many false positives. But that's a passive tool; it just sits on the network. Encryption touches your infrastructure. When anything, whenever anything touches your infrastructure, it can't be fully fully automated. You have to understand what's going on there. Uh, at least I don't. I don't. Maybe someone will come up with a solution to that. I don't know one. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely fascinating because I, I work with and and speak to a lot of different universities. And people want to go into cyber, they want to be pen testers, they want to be reverse engineers. But the cryptography aspect, unless you're in a military university, doesn't really exist. It, it almost feels like it's, you know, if you want to get a cryptographer, you got to fight the NSA, FBI, DOD, Army, Navy, Air Force, and the Marine Corps to get those guys. And well, I'll take it further. It's much more sexy to be an attacker than a defender. And it's much harder to be a defender than an attacker. So yeah, pen testing, these are all really important. I'm not belittling them at all. But being on the side of defense is, 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 is uh, much more challenging. Indeed. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and here's hoping that technology kind of steps up and, and takes it to the next level. I know we're going to have you on again in the future. And, and I've got so many more questions because I really want to get into the, the whole conversation. And we'll do this next time. So, so for our listeners and people who are watching, we'll do this next time, I promise. But I want to talk about quantum encryption uh, and, oh. and kind of the new form of, of, 
of, of, of quantum encryption. Um, I've been working with a few friends of ours from the CDC on quantum computing and quantum, quantum encryption. And, you know, you're kind of the master of it. So uh, I can't wait to pick your brain on that topic next time I have you on. So uh, Professor Yuta Lendel, founder and CEO of Unbound Tech, one of our latest sponsors, guys. Make sure you go, you check out their amazing white paper. I know after reading it myself, it helped me uh, understand key management just a little bit better. And th there's not enough that you can understand about cryptography. It's something where you got to dab into it every single day to get better at it. Because just like we discussed, there's not enough people to help you manage it. And there's even even from a institution side, like from 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 industry, you can't find enough people at some of the big four firms that understand this that are able to come and help you. There's, there's not enough people that you can pay for it. So it's a, you got to self-educate yourself a lot or go and are, you're not teaching anymore, are you, Professor Lindo? I'm on leave now. Yeah, I can't be a CEO <laughs> and a professor at the same time. <laughs> I was going to say, well, we can all just go to Israel and, and, and take one of your classes because that, you know, I, I, I'd never, uh, I never say no to a flight to Israel. And, I'll, and, I'll, I'll recommend Dan Bonet's uh, Coursera course uh, from Stanford. It's a great course in cryptography. I recommend it to everybody. Awesome. So, Professor Lindo, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for your support of the Cyber Hub Engage podcast. Folks, the link to the white paper is going to be attached to the description in this video. So if you're watching, it's below. If you're listening, just hit the details on your podcast and you'll see the link right there to download this white paper. It's a great weekend read um, for those that are uh, living in the southeast of the U.S. It's going to be rainy this weekend, which you know what that means. It's a great time to turn on the fireplace pour yourself a little bourbon and read a little bit about cryptography otherwise professor lindo thanks so much for coming on i really do thank you very it. much those for tuning in thank you so much for listening to the cyber hub engage daily cyber briefing professor yuda lendl he is an absolute treasure trove we don't have enough time to pick his brain for everything i want to pick his brain on but i'm as we have him more on, I'll pick his brain more. Next time we'll be talking a little bit more about quantum cryptography because that's really the uh, the future. And, you know, we talked about 10 years from now. Well, <laughs> 10 years from now, it's going to be quantum cryptography and, and it, it, it'll, it'll be an enterprise kind of sort of business. And so having said that, thanks so much for tuning in. If you can tell I'm supporting my 49ers tomorrow, go Niners, beat the Vikings. We got to get back to the Super Bowl. And for Micah there, I just want to remind you, 28 and 3, buddy. Um, it, it, it is 28 and 3. So thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe. Give us five stars. Comment Unbound Tech. Make sure you download the white paper in the description of the podcast. That's it for me today. Have a great weekend. We'll be back with so much more on Monday. Until then, stay cyber safe.